Good evening, everyone. My name is Crystal Ross. I'm one of the service line directors for the Cancer Institute. Welcome tonight, and thank you for attending our Head of Cancer Lecture Series. Tonight, we are really excited to welcome Dr. Warren Swiggle, who will be talking to us this, this evening about advances in head and neck cancer. There are a few logistics that we wanna go over prior to the presentation. First of all, if you are on Zoom, you are able to um, type into the chat portion of the Zoom connection and any questions or um, comments that you have, we'll be happy to address those if we have time at the end of the, the lecture. Um, participants are not able to speak during the lecture, but certainly please feel free to put information or questions into the chat. So welcome, Dr. Swiegel. Dr. Swiegel is a head and neck cancer surgeon who specializes in transoral robotic surgery, endocrine surgery, and the treatment of salivary conditions. Originally from Pittsburgh, he joined AHN after completing his fellowship in head and neck cancer at the Johns Hopkins Hospital. Focused on patient quality of life outcomes, such as xeriostoma, he is involved in bench to bedside research aimed at restoring salivary gland function. He's a site lead for multi-institutional collaboration, which utilizes stem cells to regenerate damaged salivary glands, saliva glands, excuse me. Dr. Swiegel also chairs the Procedure Space Efficiency Task Force as part of the Perioperative Executive, Executive Committee and is the Associate Program Director for Otolaryngology residency program. Welcome, Dr. Swiggle. I know that was a mouthful, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That, that sounded much more impressive than I feel. Thank you. So good evening, everybody. Uh, and thank you for coming this evening or joining via, uh, via Zoom. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Great. Um, so as stated, uh, my name is Warren Swiggle. I'm a head and neck uh, cancer surgeon here at Allegheny Health Network. Um, as mentioned, uh, originally from Pittsburgh, actually born here in this hospital and happy to, to be back. Uh, and so tonight I'll be talking to you about uh, some advances in head and neck cancer uh, and looking to the future. Um, I will be presenting or showing some, uh, some products and devices. I have no industry relationships, however, to disclose or biases. Uh, I do have uh, some NIH funding for an R01 related to uh, the research that we do. <clears throat> and so with that, I'd like to remind everybody this month, April is Head and Neck Cancer Awareness Month. Um, this week specifically, if I recall, is oral cavity uh, cancer awareness. Um, and so very timely for our, our uh, head of cancer presentation. Um, now, most of the people on Zoom and in the audience uh, are patients, family members, uh, and so my goals today are to really provide an overview of, of what head and neck cancer is like for a patient, um, discussing some of the signs and symptoms, discuss a patient's journey through the diagnosis, treatment, and survivorship of head and neck cancer, review some prevention strategies, uh, since that is very pertinent, and then also, most importantly, looking to the future, talk about what may be coming down the road in the next several years to the next decade. And so the very first thing I think we need to do is define what, what do I mean by head and neck cancer? That's a pretty general term. Um, and so these really, you know, most of us in head and neck cancer come from an otolaryngology or ear, nose, and throat background. Uh, and so these are cancers that involve the ear, nose, and throat, not the brain necessarily or the spine uh, or the esophagus, but really focused mostly on what's called the upper aerodigestive tract. That includes things like the nasal cavity, nasopharynx, the oral cavity, oropharynx, the voice box or larynx, as well as the hypopharynx. Now that also includes other sites, things like the thyroid gland, salivary glands, like the parotid or submandibular gland, as well as skin cancers. We do treat skin cancers of the head and neck uh, and also cross over with lymphoma since we do have lymphatics in the head and neck. Now for this evening's discussion, I'm gonna focus on cancers of the upper aerodigestive tract since they are the most common and uh, sometimes the most um, complex to treat in a sense. And specifically, I'm gonna focus on cancers of the oropharynx, specifically the tonsil and the base of tongue. Now, the reason I'm going to focus on this, uh, I, I promise only to show two graphs tonight. 
um, based on statistics, but this is a, from a paper in 2014 showing the, uh, the trends in oropharynx uh, cancer as well as other head and neck cancers. And you can see most of those lines are trending down. Again, especially in this, uh, this graph to the right here, again, you can see oral cavity cancers downtrending, larynx cancers downtrending, and other cancers, like I said, of the nasopharynx or hypopharynx going down. However, you see this pretty steep line headed upwards for oropharynx cancer. That's cancers of the tonsils and the base of tongue. They are one of the few cancers that are increasing in incidence, number of cancers seen per year. And specifically, that tends to be men with oropharyngeal cancer as opposed to women. You may ask, why is this? And there's, there's one clear answer, and that's because of the HPV virus, the human papillomavirus. This is a virus that causes cervical cancer, anal cancer, genital warts, as well as cancers of the tonsil and the base of tongue. And as we see more and more of it, the incidence is increasing. Now, as I mentioned, I think my main goal today is to walk you through what it's like to try to, you know, to be a patient with head and neck cancer from initial symptoms to diagnosis through diagnosis to getting a, a staging or prognosis, talking about treatment, deciding on treatment options, and then going through survivorship and what that may be like initially. Again, if, even for those of us who treat head and neck cancer, we only tend to see snippets of it. And so seeing what that patient experience, I think is very key to understanding how we take those next steps, what we do moving forward. Uh, and so that's, that's how I want to present it today. Plus from a patient perspective, it's important to know if you get head and neck cancer, what may, your journey may be like. And so like any good patient presentation, we'll, we'll start with a case vignette. Uh, this is kind of our standard head and neck cancer patient now. This is a middle-aged man uh, who noticed he has a, a lump on the side of his neck, a neck mass. He noticed it while shaving approximately two months ago. It doesn't hurt. It moves around. It doesn't really bother him. It's just there. He doesn't have a sore throat, doesn't have any problems swallowing, no change in his voice just the neck bump. And he's uh, never smoked, doesn't, doesn't drink alcohol excessively. And so he, he goes to his primary care physician, his primary care physician being an astute PCP says, neck mass is cancer until proven otherwise. Let's get you over to a head and neck cancer surgeon. And so patient gets referred to a head and neck cancer surgeon um, and his journey continues there. Now, occasionally I'll I'm gonna try as best as I can to present what a patient may be experiencing in the moment. Um, again, not just from a cancer perspective, but we also should understand what that patient may be feeling when they get that news that, hey, you have a neck lump, it might be cancer, I'm going to send you to a surgeon. That patient may be confused, but doc, can't you just give me some antibiotics? Concerned and have some anxiety, well, I, I might have cancer and there may even be some guilt there. You know, a lot of head and neck cancer patients may feel guilt that, oh, I've sat on this for two months or six months or however long. And so uh, these are all things as, as providers we need to be aware of. And as, as patients, it's, it's reasonable to fear these things. Now, we mentioned some of the other symptoms of head and neck cancer that a patient may have. These are things like persistent pain or sore throat, change in voice. Problems swallowing and pain with swallowing. These are two different things. Pain with swallowing is I can swallow what I want. It just hurts. Difficulty swallowing or dysphagia is more of I can't eat certain foods because they get stuck or they go down the wrong pipe. As this patient, this patient noticed a mass. Other patients notice lesions, ulcers in the mouth, uh, sometimes things on the skin and bleeding. Bleeding may be a sign as well. Now, all of us may feel some of these things at any point in our life. Anytime you have an upper respiratory tract infection, you may feel four or five of these. Now, these symptoms specifically are those that last for several weeks and months and are severe enough that they may change how you act, change how you, um, or make you take medicine for them or change how you go about your day to day. So there is some intensity to these symptoms as well. And so when, when patients get referred to the head and neck cancer surgeon, there's usually a pretty standard path that they follow within that visit. It usually starts out with a focused history. 
obtain a timing of symptoms. How long has it been there? How intense is it? What have you done for it? Get a thorough cancer history. Have you ever had cancer before? Does your family ever have a history of cancer? And then get in what we would call an exposure history. Do you smoke? Do you drink alcohol? Things that can increase your risk for head and neck cancer. That's usually followed by a thorough head and neck exam, looking in the ears, the nose, the mouth, taking a feel of the neck, and then sometimes a detailed exam of the, the inside of the throat. Looking for, again, are there other lumps or bumps? Are there enlarged lymph nodes? Are there other lesions? Is there other concerning signs that say, yes, this is a cancer or no, this isn't a cancer. And then sometimes we do other things to augment our exam, things like scopes, endoscopy, looking in the nose with a camera, looking down at the voice box with a camera to get a more detailed view, areas we can't reach uh, just by looking from the outside. Some people like to use an ultrasound, especially in the case of a neck mass. Uh, some head and neck surgeons are trained to, to use the ultrasound in clinic, uh, again, to look in more detail. And then sometimes a biopsy is recommended. Yes, I see something. Let's Let's see what it is. And that usually is done with a biopsy. And so to get back to our patient, uh, again, he noticed that left neck mass. On exam, it is mobile, meaning moves around, most likely a lymph node. On exam, there's also left tonsil mass that was seen. Kind of some tissue back where the tonsil should be, looks irregular, maybe bleeds when you touch it. The patient's a little surprised because wasn't didn't realize that was even there doesn't look in the back of his throat all that frequently. Um, and then that would prompt a, a scope to be performed, a flexible laryngoscopy, to look at the base of tongue and voice box, which in this patient's situation were all clear. And so because of the tonsil mass and because of the neck mass, there is a high suspicion for a cancer. And so usually a biopsy would be recommended. Now that may be done in the office if feasible, if not, if it's a difficult to reach area, say of the voice box, that may be uh, something we need to go to the operating room for, where you have to go to sleep in order to obtain, uh, to get the biopsy. And then scans might be ordered, CT scan, PET scan, uh, again, to get more information. Now, patient is a little more concerned now definitely worried, stressed, and the biopsies performed, maybe even in some pain. And so we need to think about next steps moving forward. So usually takes several days to come back and those can be an anxious several days, but eventually in this patient situation, the biopsy came back, squamous cell carcinoma, HPV, or excuse me, P16 positive, which to us tells us it's HPV. That's the most uh, common type of throat cancer. Just like you can get squamous cell carcinoma of the skin, you can get squamous cell carcinoma of the throat. And the HPV or the P16 tells us this is likely from the human papillomavirus. Now, many people ask, why, why is that important? P16 positive versus negative. And again, this is, I believe, the second and last graph I put up there. Um, but it's a very important one. Uh, this is from a landmark paper uh, published in 2010 that really differentiated cancers caused by HPV and cancers not caused by HPV, specifically cancers of the tonsil and the base of tongue. Now, I may use P16 positive and HPV interchangeably. They don't mean the exact same thing. P16 is a protein our bodies make. And when you have HPV-related cancer, we see a lot of that protein. It's just much easier to test for that protein than it is to test for the virus. So we usually test for that protein first and sometimes may need to test for that virus later. But the big, big key here is that on this survival curve, higher numbers mean better survival. Patients with HPV positive cancers of the tonsil and the base of tongue are much have much higher survival rates, meaning they're much, like, much more likely to survive through treatment than HPV negative, and much less likely to have the cancer come back after it's treated. And that's a very significant difference to point out. And so this is one of the major factors that tells us a tonsil tumor, one tonsil tumor is extremely different than the other one. HPV positive tumors tend to be lower stage, stage one and stage two, 
where HPV negative tumors tend to be higher stage, stage three or four. And again, that's a marker of how aggressive they are. Again, we talked about improved survival rates, but most importantly, this drives treatment strategies and treatment decisions. And so now that we have our diagnosis in stage, now we start to talk about, well, what treatments make the most sense? And so for patients, you may hear, okay, well, I'm gonna present you a tumor board. You may not know what tumor board is. You may have heard about tumor board. Some of you may have attended tumor board. But the key concept behind tumor board is multidisciplinary care. Cancer care is a team-based sport. It's complex. There are a lot of things that can happen. There are a lot of nuances to treatment. And so it takes more than just the head and neck surgeon to get you through. And so having a well uh, put together multidisciplinary team is essential to good quality care. And so oftentimes, like I said, patients present to their or show up to the head and neck cancer surgeon first. I apparently really like this tie. Um, but soon, especially at tumor board, we may have a medical oncologist and the radiation oncologist involved. To help us out, we also have our, our friendly pathology and radiology providers to, like, to look at the scans and the pathology and review these. But we also include many other services. Head and neck cancers can cause swallowing problems. Treatment of head and neck cancers can cause swallowing problems. So we have speech and swallow therapists. Radiation can cause dental disease. Sometimes cancers involve the dentition and teeth and our oral surgery colleagues and dental colleagues need to be involved in their care. Lymphedema is common. And so uh, patients undergo onco rehab for neck stiffness, lymphedema treatment. And you can imagine as we add layers and layers and providers, this is becoming more and more complex. And so we have nurse navigators to help patients or assist patients and navigate the system. We also have residents and fellows uh, who are uh, part of patient care. Research coordinators, we offer multiple clinical trials uh, that patients may be candidates for. And again, we've now been talking about the stresses and the worry and the anxiety there's a high rate of depression in head and neck cancer patients. And so oftentimes patients need to talk to a psychiatrist or a psychologist. Patients can be in pain. So we have palliative medicine. And again, the, the cost of cancer care is pretty significant. And so if needed, we have financial counselors. And so this is our kind of, I say core multidisciplinary team. This is, this is a pretty big team actually. And um, being part of it is, is quite an honor. So. But at Tumor Board, the main goal is to talk about treatment strategies and what, what's next. And so there are three main treatment strategies to treat cancer. That's surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy. And that treatment uh, is based on a couple things. Very first is NCCN criteria. That is the National Cancer Network recommendation. So we start with that and say, okay, what would everybody else in the country do? What makes sense based on the research? And then from there, we talk about effectiveness. What is going to be the most effective treatment? And what I mean is what is going to be the treatment that is most likely to cure the patient of their cancer and not have a comeback? Where is the cancer? That plays a huge role. Is the cancer in the mouth? Is the cancer of the voice box? Are there lymph nodes involved? Has the cancer spread outside of the head and neck? What are the risks? If cancer or if the treatment options are equal when it comes to treatment strategies and effectiveness, maybe one has worse side effects than the other. And then obviously patient choice is one of the main driving factors. If you have multiple options, you present all those options to the patient, walk them through what those, uh, what the treatment strategies are, and then let them pick what, what they want to do uh, regarding their cancer care. And again, one of the major driving goals is also to avoid all three treatment options. We really try to avoid doing surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy. If we can get away with one treatment option, that's the best. Second best would be two. And so that we tend to divide it into true two general treatment strategies. Either patients who go on to have surgery, oftentimes followed by radiation, a low dose of radiation, or patients who have radiation first, sometimes with chemotherapy involved as well. And so to touch on, uh, on each treatment strategy, uh, again, for, for, for patients, um, 
from a radiation perspective, uh, the technique they use is what's called IMRT or intensity modulated radiation therapy. Um, this uses external beam radiation, shooting the beams through multiple detectors at the cancer. And then using image guidance and 3D conformal techniques, they can map out the tumor and plan the dose of radiation. You can see the picture here, you have a tonsil tumor on the left side, and then they can actually map out the dose levels to the tonsil as well as to the neck and contralateral structures. And so in terms of uh, the radiation dose, um, this is important, uh, an important point because radiation, we'll talk about dose, we'll talk about high dose versus low dose, we'll talk about de-escalation, and it all is about how much dose are you getting. And think about it like dose of medicine. There is a dose that is given per day over a certain period of time. And most of the time, primary radiation to the head and neck is 70 gray. So that's 35 treatments, which is usually five days a week for seven weeks. Now, if you're getting it after surgery, that tends to be a little lower, 50 to 60 gray. And so it's five to six weeks of treatment. But the reason that's important, you may say, what's the difference between 10, 10 fraction, or excuse me, 10 gray? Um, it's, it's significant. Dose is, uh, or side effects are very dependent on dose. And the difference between 60 and 70 is significant. And the difference between 50 and 60 is quite significant. Moving on to chemotherapy or immunotherapy. Again, can be given for before surgery or radiation. Now that tends to be safe for extremely advanced cancers when used for induction. Um, most of the time it is given with radiation. It is used as a radio sensitizer, meaning it makes the radiation work better. It primes the cells to be, destructed by the, be destroyed by the radiation. Unlike many cancers, it tends to be single agent as opposed to multiple different chemotherapy drugs or regimen, it tends to be one drug cisplatin, carboplatin, um, although that, that may vary, uh, and can be given either weekly or three times during radiation, uh, somewhere in the beginning, middle, and, and the end. Uh, there's also immunotherapy, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, I think the idea is we are still trying to figure out how best to use immunotherapy. Currently, it is used as a second-line treatment, not a primary treatment. Um, one of the nice parts about immunotherapy, which makes it attractive is while it is a systemic medication, meaning it goes throughout your whole body, it is still targeted, meaning it is much more targeted to cancer cells, thus making it more tolerable. And then of course there's surgery, being a surgeon, I got to talk about surgery. And so the decision when it comes to, do we do surgery or not is again, is made based on effectiveness. Is it better than the other options? Is the tu what or where is the tumor? And most importantly, can we get it all? If there is a patient where I'm questioning, can we get rid of this tumor? Surgery is probably not appropriate. There's no point in leaving tumor behind in a lot of cases, because then you're going to have to get radiation and chemo afterwards anyway. What are the side effects? Cancers of the larynx, perfect example. Small cancer of the voice box. If I remove it with surgery, I can cause permanent dysphonia, changes in your voice changes in swallowing. Most people heal up fine, but there is a significant risk that you don't and have permanent voice problems. And so the other option, radiation, just as effective as surgery. And oftentimes patients get better, not worse. And so in situations with small tumors of the voice box, sometimes radiation is preferred. And then obviously patient factors. Patients need to be healthy to undergo surgery. Some of the surgeries we do are 10 to 12 hours sometimes 14 to 16. And so patients, that's like running a marathon. Patients need to be in the appropriate condition to do that. And so oftentimes, like I said, our tumor board discussion is what makes more sense, radiation or surgery, radiation or surgery. And sometimes there's a clear winner and other times the patient gets to pick. And again, in this patient's situation, both radiation and surgery are reasonable options. Um, single mass in the tonsil, single lymph node in the neck, both HP or HPV positive, meaning that this patient either way is likely to do very well with treatment. And so the patient would discuss these options both with the radiation oncologist, as well as the head and neck surgeon. I don't think you want me talking about what the side effects of radiation are and giving you a clear picture. And I can tell you, I don't really want the radiation oncologist trying to tell you what side effects from surgery are going to be. And then Again, patient autonomy is number one factor here. 
patient gets to decide. And in our situation, the patient decides for surgery. And so what that means in technical terms is transoral robotic radical tonsillectomy with a left-sided neck dissection. And so to get into specifically and break that down, transoral robotic surgery with a radical tonsillectomy that is done through the mouth. Unlike a regular tonsillectomy you would get as a child or for sleep apnea, we're removing more than just the tonsil. The tonsil, the cancer, and then like all surgeries you have to, or cancer surgeries, you have to take a margin around it. And in the oropharynx, that means the side of the throat, as well as the layer of muscle underneath. And that's an important muscle for swallowing. Then to remove the, the enlarged lymph node, that uh, requires an incision on the outside of the neck. The enlarged cancer lymph node is removed as well as the chain of lymph nodes that it lives in. That chain of lymph nodes is determined by where the original cancer is. Uh, but the idea being that if cancer is in one lymph node, there could be spread to other lymph nodes. And by removing that chain, we could potentially uh, block it from, from coming back. Uh, in our experience here, this tends to be a two night stay in the hospital, usually about a three to four week recovery. What the patient feels is significant discomfort, unfortunately. It's probably the worst sore throat of your life um, for a good two to three weeks. You have some temporary problems swallowing. Again, having removed uh, that pharyngeal constrictor, that's important for swallowing function. Most patients experience weight loss, usually 10 to 15 pounds because they're on an altered diet. And there's a risk of bleeding. We're now exposing some arteries in the throat that can bleed after surgery. That risk is low, but it's serious. And I hope that some patients start to feel some relief. Cancer's out. Now we can move forward. Now, for those of you not familiar with the robot, again, kind of like tumor board, you hear us talk about the robot, you hear us talk about lasers. And so I did want to show some pictures of the fancy robot we have. Um, and so this is the model we have. This is uh, uh, the newest generation uh, robot for uh, really designed for four cancers of the ears, or excuse me, cancers of the throat, as well as urologic cancers. Um, there are three operating arms. Sorry. You can see here that move independently. They're both wristed and elbow movements meaning you can rotate the head 360 degrees as well as the elbow. That allows you to get into a small space. The camera, instead of being either a straight or angled camera, is also, uh, also articulates kind of like a snake head, allowing you to operate within the space the size of about a tennis ball. And if you can imagine the back of your throat is about the size of a tennis ball. And that's brought in on the patients uh, next to the patient and those instruments inserted into the mouth. Again, now we get a microscopic view of the cancer, a close-up view of the cancer, and can perform very detailed uh, tasks with those articulate arms. And so after the cancer is out, after the patient recovers, in this patient's situation, one enlarged lymph node, one cancer in the tonsil, they're done. No further treatment needed. And so the patient has now entered survivorship. Now is when they start to recover and we have to monitor for disease, the disease not to come back. And usually that involves a scan about three months after surgery. If that scan is clear, then we continue monitoring. That includes regular follow-ups and treatments for at least five years. And a large focus, again, like I said, is on recovery and rehabilitation. If you have problems swallowing after radiation or surgery, we involve our speech and swallow therapists. Again, we've involved them from the beginning. And so we've tried to prevent some of these things from happening, but now if they do happen, can treat them. Again, speech problems, patients who undergo total laryngectomy, we've removed their voice box. There's speech rehab that needs to happen afterwards. Muscle tightness, lymphedema, that's where we get our onc rehab team involved. Dry mouth, number one patient complaint after radiation, lasts for months to years, some patients never fully recover. And so these are things they have to deal with on a daily basis. And like we talked about, there's a high incidence of depression because while the cancer is gone, we may have made significant changes to this patient's life. 
And so the best thing we can do is prevent the cancers from happening in the first place. And again, this is the reason I wanted to focus on HPV specifically, because we have a great way to prevent it. There is a vaccine for HPV virus. There's, uh, it's specifically targeted to HPV subtype 16 and 18. There's many different subtypes, but those two are the most common causes of, uh, of cervical cancer as well as um, tonsil cancer. They are sexually transmitted. This is a sexually transmitted disease. Um, I know it's kind of taboo to talk about, but we're going we're gonna to put it out there because it is important to talk about when to vaccinate. So like I said, there were three vaccines available that cover these two subtypes as well as a number of other subtypes. And the recommended age for vaccination is 11 to 12 years old before exposure. Getting the vaccine before exposure is much more effective than getting it after exposure. It's still slightly effective. Um, I occasionally get the question of, well, now that I have cancer, is the vaccine going to help? And the short answer is we don't know yet. Those studies are being done, not fully uh, not fully done. But most importantly is if we started a, an aggressive vaccination campaign today, we wouldn't see a reduction in cancers for another 20 years. And that's because it's not that you get the virus and it all of a sudden causes a cancer. It should get the virus. Your body doesn't clear it. It lives in the cells of the tonsil and the base of tongue. Over time, over decades, 20, 30, 40 years, slowly causes DNA changes, which then lead to cancer formation. And so all of those people who are currently exposed now may go on to develop cancer and the vaccine won't be effective. And so really, this is looking to the future. What can we do to prevent cancer 20 years from now, 30 years from now? The other obvious cancer prevention is smoking and alcohol cessation. <laughs> Again, that's for almost all cancers. They're two of the major risk factors for head and neck cancer. Um, and we should always continue to focus on continue, or, um, <coughs> uh, quitting smoking as well as reduction of alcohol intake. And uh, for those people who abuse alcohol, complete sobriety. So looking ahead, let me just check the time here. Okay. Well, I've kind of set up for you what a cancer patient journey is like. Now, where can we make improvements? What is going to happen in the next five, 10, 15 years? Um, and again, I wanted to keep this kind of at a, a patient family member level. And so I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty detail of uh, salivary uh, analysis and testing or molecular testing and what genes we're looking for. But in, in broad terms, there are multiple areas to focus on. There's not going to be any one magic drug or pill that's going to solve it, unless you can prevent it with the vaccine. But at each step, there needs to be improvements. There needs to be faster diagnosis, better accuracy of prognosis and staging, having a better idea of what the cancer is going to do so we can then decide what treatment makes the most sense. Obviously, treatment is going to continue to evolve over time. And then afterwards, who do we need to watch after for five years? Who can we say, your cancer's gone, it's never coming back, don't worry. And then, like I said, even restoring that function afterwards in survivorship. Lots of advancements to be made there. One area um, our group is focused on, uh, good work by uh, uh, my partners, uh, Dr. Rusia, as well as Dr. Lowe. Um, and Dr. Arshun, uh, really looking at, here we're focused on time to treatment. So we know that time from the diagnosis to the end of treatment is extremely important and can make a big difference in a patient's cancer journey and cancer care and their, their survival. And so we're looking at ways to improve or sh shorten that time, not necessarily shorten the, the length of treatment per se, but shorten that time in between, the time the patient is sitting at home waiting for the phone call waiting to see the next person. And so a lot of parallel processing. This is a lot of process improvement, things like improving access, just getting the patient into the clinic faster so we can get the diagnosis faster. Looking at treatment pathways. Can we set up clear treatment pathways and say, yep, this patient has this cancer. We put them on this track. They're seen by these people and just 
keep keep them moving forward. And then coordinating care. Again, that's that key of multidisciplinary care, having us all in the same team so that we know what the other person is going to do, can anticipate, and can keep moving forward in an efficient manner. With regard to diagnosis, there are a lot, a lot of one-off studies um, out there. There is nothing, that's the word I want to use, um, no one specific test yet. But I get the sense as the research comes out that in the next several years, there will be a saliva test. You swab your mouth, you spit into a cup. It'll tell you, are you at risk for cancer or not? Maybe it's looking at HPV DNA. Maybe it's looking at cancer uh, markers or epitopes. Again, the specific test isn't there yet, but there are a lot of potential options out there. Narrow band imaging is something that's been around for a long time ways to say, hey, I see a spot. Is that spot concerning for cancer or not? Again, using our UV light or regular light, uh, that may be difficult to tell, but narrowing the wavelength spectrum can help you see vascularity, can help you see changes that you can't see with the naked eye. Genetic testing. This is something we already do for thyroid cancer. Oftentimes, thyroid cancer biopsies are inconclusive. It looks a little irregular, a little suspicious, can't tell you if it's cancer or not. Well, now we can take that specimen, take that biopsy, send it off, look for genetic mutations, look for microsatellite instability, look for other changes that say, yes, this is more likely to be a cancer. And that drives what we then can do. I foresee that that's going to be happening to other types of cancer, um, whether it be tonsil cancer. Again, HPV is similar to this. HPV tells us Yes, it's this type of cancer versus this type of cancer and treatment's going to differ. And then there's always the question of, well, shouldn't we just be screening everybody? Well, screening has a lot of, a lot of its own issues. And so you need a very clear screening program that can pick up undetectable cancers, but also weed out those patients who don't have cancer. And so we don't quite have a clear, great screening ability yet. But again, is it going to be the salivary testing? Is it going to be circulating tumor DNA? Unclear, but again, that, that I think is going to be coming in the next 10 years. From a prognosis and staging standpoint, again, we talked about HPV. That has been one of the number one prognostic indicators telling us, yes, you are likely to do well or no, hey, we have to be more aggressive with treatment. There's a lot of research into different subtypes of oral cavity cancer, looking at the genetics of oral cavity cancer, looking at the mutations behind them. The idea is mutations drive function. And so form follows function. And if the mutations are on one pathway, then it might be more aggressive. Or if the mutations are on a different pathway, then, well, maybe this spreads faster than the other types. Or again, third subtype tends not to spread, just tends to grow locally. You should be able to remove it, no problem, don't need any radiation afterwards. And so as those details come out, I foresee that as we develop those molecular tests, those will help tell us that, yeah, those 10 cancers that we all treated the same before, we're all going to start treating differently because of those changes. Again, this is all kind of personalized medicine, right? And then importance to things like tumor grade, things we've been looking at for years and decades are coming into new light as well. We talked about mutational analysis and that personalized medicine. And this is the, it's the era of big data and AI. The number of papers looking at using artificial intelligence to, to diagnose and stage head and neck cancer has absolutely skyrocketed. I don't think I can pick up a journal now that doesn't have an article about artificial intelligence use in the diagnosis of larynx cancer or predicting patient outcomes. And again, as we are better at collecting data, have bigger uh, um, pools of data, we can use AI for these situations. Um, again, it's helpful to understand what the artificial intelligence is, is actually using to make those decisions, and that can be difficult on the back end. Again, I'm not an AI expert and don't intend to go into those details, but um, lots of, I would say, lots of potential. And again, understanding these differences, again, the key is that this drives treatment. So diving into those treatment changes, admittedly, slightly busy slide. Um, 
but I'm going to break it down from each treatment subsite. So from a medical oncology standpoint, the things we are actively doing have trials for open now that we are looking to answer, questions we're looking to answer. Dosing. Does three times during radiation versus once a week matter? Does the type of chemotherapy matter? Does it matter for salivary glands whether they get chemotherapy or not? It's the same treatment we've been using, but there's nuances to how that is used that, like I said, we actively have trials open for. How best to use immunotherapy? You know, do you use a PD-1 inhibitor? Do you use a CTLA-4 inhibitor? Do we try to find another target for head and neck cancer? You know, some of these therapies work great after treatment. Some may work even better ahead of time. And so, you know, window of opportunity trials to say, hey, patient's having surgery. Let's just put them on this medication before they have surgery, take their cancer out and look at it afterwards. Those are the types of trials where the patient is getting standard of care. Yes, I'm planning to do surgery, but let's give you something else to see if that can help ahead of time. And then when we take the tumor out, we can see what the tumor or the uh, immunologic microenvironment is. We can see if there has been regression of the tumor. And so these are all the trials that are going to help us answer how we use immunotherapy more effectively in head and neck cancer. Regard to radiation, it's not just about adding treatment. It's about de-escalation as well. Can we take treatment away? We talked about dose before. Dose is important for side effects. HPV tumors are very sensitive to radiation. We don't necessarily have to treat them at 70 gray. We may be able to use 60. We may be able to use 50. We may be able to use 30. And so as we scale back on the dose, patients may do the same and may have much less side effects moving forward. The other, I don't say breakthrough, but one way of delivering radiation, protein, or excuse me, proton beam therapy. It's a way of delivering radiation, same setup. You lay on a table, external beam radiation, but the carrier of that radiation is different. You can be much more focused. You saw uh, the picture before where I had the tonsil and then the area of radiation around it. That can be much more narrow, especially in the head and neck when we have lots and lots of critical structures. You may not want to radiate the salivary gland next to the tonsil. So you can be much more focused. These proton beam emitters are throughout the country. There's only a handful out there now. Apparently they're very expensive. Um, but that may be the next wave in terms of advancements in radiation. And then from a surgery perspective, we're always trying to innovate in surgery. Things like tumor visualization. You know, using fluorescent uh, or autofluorescence and UV light to identify where the tumor is. And so that when you go to, re go to remove it, you can see it better. Or um, it works great for oral cavity cancers where you may not be able to see, you have to kind of guess how deep is that tumor. You're feeling it. You're looking at, see how the tissues react. Well, if I have a special set of glasses I can put on and say I'm five millimeters away from the tumor, well, then I'm going to be much more accurate, be able to get all the way around it more um, with a better margin. Um, minimally invasive techniques. You know, I would argue that the robot is more minimally invasive than what we used to do, which is cut the jaw in half, move the tongue one side, move the jaw the other side, and under direct visualization, remove the tumor or the back of the tongue, and then close everything up. That's a pretty morbid surgery that has lots of side effects. Now, by able, being able to go through the mouth, patients do much better. Advanced reconstruction techniques. I have up here a picture of a patient who had a jaw cancer. Might have even been one of your patients. <laughs> and we could plan ahead of time based on the patient's CT scan. Here's the cancer. Here's where we're going to make our cuts. Have them 3D print that reconstruction plate have them 3D print cut guides so that I can screw the cut guides on the jaw. My reconstructive surgeon can put them on the leg bone. I make cuts, he makes cuts and it fits together almost like an erector set. It speeds up surgery. So now the 14 to 16 hour surgery becomes a 10 to 12 hour surgery. Patients recover faster, they heal better. Combining minimally invasive, invasive uh, minimally invasive approaches with reconstruction, 
one of the things we did, uh, what is it, 20, 2021, a couple of years ago here at Allegheny General uh, was with my reconstructive partners, um, Dr. Morario and Dr. Interval. Uh, we were one of the first people to use this new SP robot, the one that I showed before, to uh, perform some reconstruction on the back of the tongue. Using tissue from the arm, we were able to, one, remove the tumor with the robot, and then replace that tissue with fresh, healthy tissue. Normally, we wouldn't do that. Normally, we would just leave that area open. It would scar, and the patient may have some significant problems swallowing. The idea is by using this minimally invasive technique, we could put tissue back there that wasn't there before and hopefully provide them a better method for swallowing, a better, uh, better ability to swallow long-term. Now, this isn't for everybody, but as we try to move the needle forward, these are the things we have to do. Moving on to surveillance, you know, one of the main questions I get other than how do you fix my dry mouth after, uh, after, after treatment is, is the cancer going to come back? That is the number one factor that weighs on patients' minds after treatment. And so we need good ways to watch out for recurrence. Again, can we use the salivary screening for diagnosis for surveillance purposes? Every three months, you spit in a cup, you mail it in, we test it, no cancer, you're good. We know that tumors secrete little bits of DNA into the blood as well. And we've started to figure out how to detect that and how to use that when it comes to surveillance. Uh, again, it's not always about adding more. It's about taking away too. Can we figure out who does well, who doesn't need to be seen every three months? Who can we see once a year, check in, make sure they're doing well. And if they're doing well, great, we'll see you next year. Decreasing scans. We don't want to keep giving patients CT scans. And so if we can do these things to screen more effectively, we can back off on the other things we're doing now. And then lastly is restoration. Um, there are multiple, multiple problems that can occur uh, with head and neck cancer. We talk about lymphedema. We talk about problems swallowing. Mucositis, oral ulcers. It's one of the main reasons patients stop swallowing and eating during radiation and chemotherapy treatment. We now have things like Helios, which is a topical solution, laser light therapy that can help reduce mucositis, allow patients to keep eating through surge or through, uh, through treatment. From a lymphedema standpoint, you know, you think of lymphedema with breast cancer, you don't, not everybody thinks about it with head and neck cancer, but the more and more we see it, the more and more radiation we do, the more and more patients get it. And the more and more we realize we need to bring in our PTOT and onc rehab team in order to, to help manage it. There's new compression devices to help squeeze that extra lymphedema tissue out. And then my personal interest is restoration of the saliva glands. Again, the other major complaint of in survivorship is dry mouth. Is the cancer going to come back and then dry mouth? And so there are multiple things we're looking into. We have a trial coming up, um, multi-institutional trial looking at ways to restore uh, the water channel, aquaporin, um, in the saliva glands. We do that by placing a catheter into the duct, the parotid duct, injecting a, it's actually a, a virus, adenovirus, that has the uh, aquaporin gene on it. That gets taken up by the gland, and then the idea is the gland is able to secrete more saliva. We're starting that phase two trial, hopefully later this summer or fall. The other thing, as I as mentioned in the beginning in the intro, we do some bench to bedside research. I uh, collaborate with a team from uh, Rice University as well as University of Michigan, where we use um, xenografts, human-derived stem, salivary stem cells. They're grown in a lab. Right now, we're at the animal study phase. We use uh, pigs um, with a radiation-induced dry mouth model, and we implant the, the salivary gland stem cells, and then watch those stem cells grow within the gland, regenerating the gland. The idea is eventually maybe we can bank your stem cells before you have radiation and then reimplant them later. So these are all, again, things that hope to happen. So to summarize, as my time kind of comes to a close, many changes in head and neck cancer, I think, are to be expected. While most head and neck cancers are 
decreasing in incidence, the number of tonsil and base of tongue cancers is going to increase for at least the next 20 years. And so we need to be prepared for that. We can prevent some of that in the future with the HPV vaccine. And as we learn more about it, we can, and advance treatment strategies, uh, patients are going to do better. Again, it's not just about treatment, it's ways of supporting the patient as well. And there are multiple ways to do that, like we talked about during diagnosis, through treatment, and then restoring them through survivorship. And so uh, with that, if anybody wants to learn more, there's two great sites I, I usually recommend. That's the American Head Neck Society. There's good information both for patients and providers uh, on the website. And then the American, uh, or excuse me, the Head Neck Cancer Alliance is a, more of a patient organization as well and support group. Uh, and so with that, I'll take any questions. We have one question in the chat, Dr. Swiggle. Okay. The HPV virus has been identified as a direct cause for tongue and tonsil cancers. Is there a link to some other factors that would cause a chondosarcoma in the larynx resulting in a total laryngectomy? Example, diet, smoking, alcohol, chemical exposure, or other. Yeah, so chondrosarcomas are pretty rare tumors. And so, um, usually there is not enough of them to, uh, so you, your question was, are there any other factors that may cause a chondrosarcoma? Mm -hmm. um, like I said, chondrosarcomas are, are fairly rare. Uh, we do not see them very frequently. And so to, to put together a study of so many patients to be able to say, yes, this is a cause, this is something that increases your chance is, is admittedly hard to do. And so we don't have a great, um, it's hard to say, yes, smoking increased your chances of it. It's hard to say, yes, alcohol did. It's hard to say anything did. You know, oftentimes it's, it's bad luck in a sense. Uh, and so unlike, unlike the virus uh, that cause, or HPV that causes uh, tonsil and basic tongue cancer, um, I am not aware of any clear definitive association for a chondrosarcoma. Thank you. And we have one more that popped up. Would you talk more about light therapy? <laughs> um, <laughs> light therapy for, well, so there's, so light therapy uh, can be used for multiple different things. Um, I talked about it briefly to, for the treatment of mucositis. Um, it can be, it can be delivered while patients are going through radiation and chemotherapy in order to reduce uh, oral ulcerations. It can also be used to treat cancer. Um, so we're developing a program here to kind of bring back what's called photodynamic therapy, uh, where you use a photosensitizer or a chemical um, you give to the patient, it gets sucked up by the cancer cells, and then you shine a laser light on the cancer. The laser light interacts with the chemical causing destruction on the cancer cells. And so it's very specific, um, or that's the idea where you're not making cuts, uh, patients tend to heal a little bit better. It's used in esophageal cancer as well as some, some forms of lung cancer. It can be used in cancers of the, the mouth and throat, um, although is not widely used. And so we're looking to, to do more of it in order to provide another option for patients. Um, those, are, those are the main reasons we would use light therapy for, for head and neck cancers. That's what we have in the chat. Are there any questions in the room? Yeah, one in the front. You take the voice box out. Do you have to have a tracheotomy in this? So uh, when we take out the voice box or what's called a total laryngectomy, um, we have to reconnect the, the windpipe. Right. Since it's not connected to the mouth anymore, you're left with a permanent what's called a stoma, where the windpipe opens up directly to the neck, a circular opening that you breathe breathe out of. Right. You don't have to have a, a trach tube in there long term. Um, usually it's just left open or there's a there's a little filter that can be placed on top. Um, but it is a, it is permanent. Any other questions? Okay, we'd like to thank all of you for attending the Ahead of Cancer lecture series. Uh, please continue to join us at our monthly Ahead of Cancer series as we focus on cancer screening, early detection, treatment, and survivorship. As a reminder, tonight's presentation was recorded on YouTube, um, and you can check back on the AHN YouTube channel at www.youtube.com backslash Allegheny Health Network.
for the full recording in about a week. This video, as well as other past lectures, are housed on that Ahead of Cancer playlist. If you'd like to schedule an appointment or have questions regarding a potential cancer concern, please call the Hope Line at 412-578-6473 to schedule an appointment, or you may call our 24-hour Nurse for You line at 412-687-4968. We'd like to invite you to have some snacks on your way out. Um, certainly help yourself, and we are really thankful, Dr. Swiggle, that was a wonderful presentation, really, and glad to have you on this um, identified month for oral cancers. Okay. All right. Thank you.